In many training circles, kata is considered a joke, something not worth doing. And you know what, Varg Freeborn? While he doesn't completely agree with that, he certainly doesn't disagree with it. So, let's talk about it. Hey, what's up? I'm Ken. This is Kenfu TV, and each week I release videos on the martial arts, philosophy, technique, training, that sort of thing. So, if that's the kind of thing that you're into, I'm glad that you're here. Today, let's talk about Varg Freeborn's book, Violence of Mind. This is not the first time that I've talked about Varg's book. Violence of Mind is an excellent book that needs to be read by anybody who's training for violence, specifically violence. If you're not, if you're training for the other many benefits of the martial arts when it comes to mental health and fitness and character and personal growth and all of those kind of things, you can take it or leave it. I encourage you to read it, but you don't have to. But if your focus is on violence and how to manage yourself when it comes to that, this is a must read. Now this isn't Varg's only book. Got another book back here, his new one that just came out, Beyond Uda, also something that I'll probably be talking about in the future. But today I want to talk about Varg's thoughts on kata. He's got many thoughts on kata, and he's got a chapter specifically on kata-based training, and that is where we'll begin. If you have this book, I'm going to be reading from page 73, which is where that chapter begins, kata-based training versus fight training. Uh, a couple things before we begin is Varg's book is focused on violence, the realities of it, and the fact that all things are part of that equation, including gunfighting. So some of the things that are in here are specific to the use of the gun and that sort of thing. But don't let that distract you if you're not a person who's trained in firearms. This still applies to anybody who trains kata, karate, taekwondo, any of the martial arts that have forms. This applies to you. If you train something that doesn't have forms, this probably still applies to you. Secondly, this is a longer chapter, so there's many things that I'm not going to say or not talk about, but I still encourage you to get this book, read this chapter and in its entirety. Just start off at the beginning of the chapter to give you a little bit of context of where he's beginning from, but then I'm going to move around a bit because this is a, a, a good chapter that has a lot of information in it, and not all of it pertains to this particular discussion. So he starts off with, there are two types of people who train and teach in combatives. Those who have actually done enough of the fighting to have the type of experience knowledge that produces true confidence and those who have only trained to fight. The problem with the training world is that the great majority of instructors out there have never really done it. This isn't a problem because they don't know what they're talking about. No, there is a lot you can learn from a dedicated student of violence or a martial art, and there are plenty of instructors who have never been in a fight but have tons of good information. I wanted to include that part to say he's not throwing away people who don't have experience. It's not about specifically experience, it's about the way that we train and the things that we consider important. So jumping ahead, one of the results of this training only dominated combatives culture is that training becomes driven by training. What this means is that instructors are 25 degrees removed from an actual experienced teacher, and as that information flows through the community, it becomes dogma by rote, or what I like to refer to as kata-based gunfight training, or kata-based training. It becomes regurgitated information rather than experienced, then shared information. I, I want to say that again. It becomes regurgitated information rather than experienced, then shared information. Movements become more like choreography than actual fight skills. This becomes a kata. Easy to copy and repeat and pass on. It's essentially a dance move as it is taught and received. Done some stuff in the dance world myself, and I can tell you that is what dance is like. It's about being able to reproduce it. It's not being able. It's not about being able to understand it. This happens because the techniques remain isolated katas, and conditioning is not taught, which will, which would allow the student to own the technique. So here we go. We're talking about the first problem, and I agree with this, which is that the majority of us, the majority of martial arts out there, are focused on being able to reproduce something that you're shown, and not about how to understand and work within this environment. That's an incredibly important thing that often gets lost, which is weird because everybody walks in the door looking for a solution to a context, and then somehow we can magically become comfortable with something that has nothing to do with that context just because we think that it's related, which is a really, really dangerous thing and can make a really easy way for somebody to become falsely confident and end up in a lot of trouble. Jumping forward, conditioning is what builds true capability. Conditioning is the only path to self-awareness and the development of naturally occurring technique. 
I've personally met several black belts who had had zero conditioning work to go with that belt. If they were to get into a real fight, if a fancy move doesn't work within the first 30 seconds, they are going to be sucking wind in a very serious way very quickly. But another very important side effect that lack of conditioning has is the practitioner never develops their own efficiencies and techniques. The innate ability to intuitively understand their own body and how to counteract their environment just never gets developed. This is big. This is probably my personal biggest struggle with kata, and I know, if you've watched this channel, I really enjoy kata. I like kata a lot, and I include it in my training. I use it. I teach it. I'm very fond. But I believe very strongly in this. If you do not train in a way that builds your understanding and your ability to perform the things that you do and are trying to get good at, then you never develop your ability to do them, and you never develop your ability to be yourself and move and understand things the way you need to. This is such an often missed thing, and probably one of the biggest things that cause kata to be so poorly regarded in the martial arts community is because so many katas have been passed specifically for the purpose of passing them. And then we have been tested on our ability to perform them, to do a performance of them, and that is what people get graded on, and they get their promotions based on, they get their X degree of black belt based on, is their ability to retain, recall, and perform kata. Kata is not fighting. Let's keep going. The emphasis becomes too often put on the perfection of movement, independent of outside variables. People really believe and teach that this is the pinnacle of accomplishment in fight training. It is not. It's only a beginning. The one who merely perfected a predictable movement in a predictable environment will lose. The one who is truly conditioned according to the principles of fighting and of what the real goal is, capabilities applied throughout adaptation to changing variables, will observe, assess, correct, and adapt. That is probably the number one thing that is wrong in the martial arts community. Now, there is a, a movement of the practical karate or practical martial arts and people pushing for an understanding. There's, there's the MMA movement where people are pushing to, to be able to adapt and do this stuff. I have no problem with MMA. My problem with MMA is it's, it, the context is not related to this, it's, but it still probably prepares you a lot better than a lot of things do. But when it comes to traditional martial arts, um, and maybe I should do a video on, on where I do think traditional martial arts are important. If you want to see that, comment. When it comes to self-defense and preservation and your ability to actually apply your martial art and to know that you can, to be confident that you can, that you got to be able to do it outside of a context of a willing partner. Here's what I see in a lot of traditional martial arts schools. If this is not your school, then I'm not talking about your school. But I've seen this school, and you might be in one. That's for you to decide. What I see in a lot of traditional schools, kata the practice of it to become really good at it. Drilling basics to become really good at basics. Now, that is actually in the next chapter and really important. Fundamentals are really important, but when I say drilling basics, I mean standing on a spot and working punch after punch after punch and just working on part of the body and never being able to build in timing and movement and some of this other stuff, but just focusing on the, the perfection of that exact movement. That, that has its function and has its limits. Then drilling with a partner where that person does a, a predictable and preset, predetermined action and you deliver a predetermined response and then you work to become excellent at it. He makes a really funny comment about how, how people get good and, and good enough to post something on Facebook and then they've made it. But that's where it goes is to that. And then sparring happens in a completely different context and the rule set doesn't really apply to the context of this. And that's where it ends. That's the problem that I see is a lot of traditional martial arts schools. It ends there, and we don't go past it. And then we're stuck in a place where everything works perfect on the mat. And hopefully we never end up in a situation outside of the mat, because the truth is, it's going to fail. Rereading that part right there. The one who is truly conditioned according to the principles of fighting. And of what the real goal is. So... You're not reading this with me. The parentheses around this next part. Capabilities applied throughout adaptation to changing variables. So that's what he's saying the goal is. The, the goal is to be able to apply your capabilities throughout adaptation to changing variables. Things are changing, whatever's happening, and you're still able to do what you are functionally capable of doing 
regardless of the facts that things constantly change. He says people who can do that will observe, assess, correct, and adapt. Remembering the sentence before that, it says people who merely perfected a predictable movement in a predictable environment will lose. He's saying the people who train this other way, according to that goal, will observe, assess, correct, and adapt. And the truth is, fighting. Fighting, not dueling, not competition. Fighting for survival, fighting for your life, fighting for your loved ones. Fighting. That definition of fighting. That is what is needed. The ability to adapt to what's happening, to utilize what's around you, to utilize your skills, your training, your environment, your tools, to be able to survive and to fight is what's needed. The next section is is on him relating this to how kata and its methodologies have been introduced into gunfighting and, and the firearms world and where he sees issues with that, things that are good about it, things that are bad about it. Um, and that's kind of where his context is in, in, in particular when it comes to this chapter. But mostly the entire book is about fighting and understanding the reality of what that fighting is. But So I skip ahead now to the last section of this chapter where he defines what he terms conditioning and why it's important. Conditioning develops the speed, strength, and endurance for the physical performance. Conditioning allows technique to naturally occur in a way the fighter truly owns. Conditioning improves performance. Improved performance increases confidence. Conditioning strengthens the orientation through psychological confidence. Confidence is the most important component of orientation to combat uncertainty. Uncertainty is the enemy of every fighter. This hits home for something else that I see in the traditional martial arts world or in the martial arts world, and some of it is in the imposter syndrome and feeling like you're, you're not who you should be or, or that people think more of you than you're capable of and you, and you don't feel as good as you are, maybe. But there's also people who have every right to feel that the way they feel that they are not as good as they are. And uncertainty has caused some of the worst damage to martial arts. To martial arts, all of it, that I can think of. And here's why. In that uncertainty, that fear of failure, that fear of being shown as a fraud who does not know how to perform or do the things that they say, that they claim... We as people who protect our ego generate circumstances, rules, traditions, etiquette, and training methodologies that support not having to be tested. Don't talk back to me. I'm, I'm an X-level black belt. You just need to take what I said and you need to go do it. You don't need to see me perform it because you should know, like, of course I can do it. You go do it. This is about you doing it. I'm not saying that every every black belt who's issuing a command, every every instructor or coach or whoever who's issuing a command needs to be questioned. Sometimes you just need to do the work. But people can hide behind that as well. They can hide behind these situations that keep them from from testing their ability and keep them in a place of power and a place of ego where where people believe and trust and 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 uh, glorify them. And they do that out of fear, out of uncertainty. I don't know that I could do this. So I'm not going to put myself in a circumstance that puts me in that place. And this happens a lot. Any school that is failing, and this is my opinion, and what I, and my opinion of what a school that is failing is, is doing, is doing that. Is possibly regurgitating garbage without context, without understanding, and with zero effort to learn or understand more about it. To protect an ego, or possibly a pocketbook, and believe me, I get it. I own a dojo, I train, I have to pay my bills, I gotta do all that stuff. And the uncertainty of whether or not you're gonna make enough money to keep it open and, and not put yourself in a bad place is a real thing. But the people who compromise on that that important ethical and moral situation in order to make sure that they're still paying the rent or in order to make sure that people still regard them highly 
are failing. They're failing their community, they're failing the people who train with them, and they're failing themselves. This is not a thing that you should want for yourself. This is a thing that will fail you, and I don't just mean in the martial arts, but it, but it creates a circumstance where what you believe, what you trust, what you know of yourself, and what you're willing to compromise on becomes something that's too much. Becomes something that you're doing too frequently. And you let your morals and your ethics lack, and then you suddenly are willing to do things that you shouldn't do, or say things you shouldn't do, or allow things you shouldn't allow. And that's not okay. And it puts people in danger. And for what? An ego? Pride? A a war story that gets retold? A a non-story that gets retold? A fancy belt? A special seat at a table? Your name on some plaque? That's worth people being in danger for? That's worth losing that for? can't have that. I'm not saying that everybody is doing this. I'm not saying that this is what's happening everywhere. I'm saying that this happens. I'm saying that I've seen it. I'm saying that that I have worked through my own struggles of being in those places where you have to make those decisions. And you have to decide whether or not who you are and your fear of people seeing a part of you that maybe you're not confident with will allow you to do something you shouldn't do and to parade around as something that you're not and to pass information that's not good at what it should be as though it is. It's not okay. It leads to bad places. It leads to why schools are in a bad, bad way. But there are good schools. So as a student, you should be assessing this stuff. You should be doing your own research. You should be studying and learning. If you're not a person who's dealing with criminal violence, but you think that you're preparing yourself for it, you should be doing your research. And your research isn't only how to make a fist and throw a punch. It's how to understand violence. It's how to understand criminals. It's how to understand the way that the world works. You need to do that research. If you're not a person who has the experience, he said it himself, he's going, we need people who have experience. And if you're not a person who has experience, you need to be studying and understanding Because the only other way to get it is experience, and you might not come out on the other side of that if you go into it unprepared. And I'm not saying the only people you can learn from are people who've been there and done that. You know what? If that were true, I'd have to close my school. That's not who I am. I don't have that experience myself. That's why I read. That's why I listen to Varg's podcast and other podcasts and primary and secondary and different things. This is why I put in the time and put in the effort to understand this world better to watch surveillance footage of of things that have happened, to understand why they happened and what went well, what worked, what didn't work, what decisions were made that led to a good result, what decisions were made that led to a bad result. It's the only way that I can do that without just putting myself in harm's way just to prove and become capable. While I'd love to be able to have that kind of experience as a thing to share, I'm not saying I want that experience. I'm saying if I, I would love to be able to prepare people from a place of experience. I'm also not willing to risk my life, my, my ability to be with my family. I'm not willing to risk those things. And I shouldn't be. So I do this. So I study. So I spend time talking to people who have experience, who have gone through things. I pay attention. So as a student, you should open your mind to more so that you can properly gauge if you are in a place that is hiding behind a lie based on the fear of uncertainty. As an instructor, you should be questioning whether or not you're allowing yourself to be in that place and to create that lie and to be able to weed out the things that are important or not important. So not every school is bad. Not every school has failed. Not every school is good. Not every school has succeeded. We've got to keep our minds open and we've got to do our homework to make sure that we're in the right place, learning the right things from the right people for the right reasons. I'm going to leave you with two things from this book, from this chapter. In this training-only environment, priorities get out of order. An experienced fighter can often recognize the experience level of another fighter by what he or she prioritizes in order of importance. Paraphrase. 
Just because a school has good stuff doesn't mean that it's coming at you in the right order, with the right level of importance, for the right reasons. Because experience is what determines that and allows for that to be done properly, to be done accurately. So studying, self-evaluation, re-evaluation, those things have to be done to make a difference and to make sure that you stay on track with your training, both as a student and as a teacher. And now I'm going to end with the beginning of the chapter where he says everything works if done at the right time. And even the greatest technique fails if done at the wrong time. His focus on conditioning and live drilling, live training, and how that conditioning creates your ability to adapt and overcome and assess and become capable of what's needed to do what you're doing successfully will always trump the ability to perfectly perform anything. I 100% believe this. My students that watch these videos will be tired of having heard me say it. But nothing that you do matters if you can't make it work. And none of your katas and drills are important if you don't know how to actually apply them. And then be able to apply them when the time is right and to know when that time is. So do I like kata? Yeah. Does Varg like kata? Maybe. He's not wholly against it. Does kata trained improperly? or prioritize too heavily, create problems? Yeah. This book is excellent, and I could read you sections of it throughout the entire book. I could read the whole book to you, because I think there's so much good stuff in here. But instead, let Varg read it to you. Link in the description for the audiobook narrated by Varg himself. He tells a little bit of his story, and a lot of bit about his philosophy, and I highly recommend it. I'm Ken. This is Kenfu TV. And I'll catch you in the next one.